But Tom Jackson, I know you like to see defense go to the go to Mile High Stadium. Still, are you a little bit surprised? Uh, not really. As I spoke with Coach Phillips this morning, he said that uh, even after they moved up the three spots uh, and made the, the deal with Cleveland, it was in order to assure themselves of getting one of the what they call the three stud linemen that were available, Copeland, Curry, or Williams. Williams was available. Uh, if not Williams, then they would have taken the second best receiver, which would have been Sean Dawkins on the board. They'll look to get that at some point later on uh, down in the draft. But I'm not surprised at the choice. I think they strengthen an area that they're already strong in. Uh, as was just stated by your set out score, everybody, you certainly can stop some people. And I think what, that's what the Broncos intend to do. The only drawback in this situation is the fact that Williams at Toledo had the three coaches in four years. Uh, that's the exact opposite of a Copeland and a Curry playing under the steady hand of a Gene Stalin. Now let's go to Fred Edelstein out in Santa Clara. Thanks, Tom. The 49ers, as we've said all morning, were hoping for one of these three linemen that you just talked about to be on the board. Once New Orleans didn't take them, they figured that maybe they would have something going with Al Davis on the 12th pick. They really thought that Denver was going to take Sean Dawkins, the wide receiver. And early this morning when they made the trade, it was expected that Denver would take one of the two receivers, Conway or Dawkins. The fact that they took Williams is a little bit of a surprise. This is the classic case of the guy who was rated high and fell. Unless the 49ers, you know, bring up some trade talks with Denver and the two organizations have a very good relationship to get Dan Williams, it's probably unlikely that the 49ers would now trade their two first-round picks to move up in the draft. Now back to Chris Berman in New York. All right, Freddie, thank you. So um, we had a feeling that all sorts of wheels were churning, but yet when push came to shove, sometimes it's... It, it, I think Dan Williams is a situation of the, and I, we hate to say it, and mark down it, it's about 218 Eastern Time, the best athlete available. Mike Gottfried uh, is back with us, and uh, Mike, Dan slipped a little lower than he thought, but uh, you, you like what they've done up front. Well, I like it, and Tom Jackson says he talks about defense. You take a player here that's a kind of a combination of Eric Curry and John Copeland. Uh, tough, strong player, can give you the inside uh, run game stopper. He's also a pass guy inside, but also could move outside. I, I think this is a great choice. I really like Dan Williams as, as really the most complete defensive lineman in the draft. As we look at Dan Williams with the Bronco, had only the third defensive lineman picked uh, in the first round by the Broncos last 15 years. Ted Gregory of Boston, 88. Don Latimer, back from the uh, tiny Tom Jackson era in 1978. Now they go uh, Williams in 93. Mel, he, uh, he played at Toledo, but he played awfully big. He wreaked havoc, really, Chris. When you look at Dan Williams, you saw games where he was dragged to the ground. Officials just ignored obvious holding penalties, or they would have probably had flags all over the field the entire game. He dominated play in the MAC and really skyrocketed up the charts after the individual workouts. When at 280 pounds, he was running in the you know the 478, 481 range. To me, the pick makes sense. When you look at him here, you can get outside. He has some power at the point of attack. And of course, the Denver Broncos had a weakness last year at that position. Kenny. Walker fell from six and a half sacks down to one and a half. So a, a guy like uh, Dan Williams fills a major need area. So he might have been the best available player on the board, but I think they knew that they had to get ahead of the Philadelphia Eagles, who were picking 13th. So they give up a third round pick. They move up a couple sp spots, guaranteeing either Williams or Dolphins. And like I said, Kenny Walker, a little undersized out of Nebraska, drops down five sacks total, down to only one and a half sacks last year. They have Dronet on the other side, Fragan at nose tackle. So to me, defensive end was a glaring weakness and there may be some good wide receivers still there in the middle of the second round so I find no problem with this pick at all. Not that surprising that uh, Dan Williams becomes the first rocket of Toledo ever picked uh, in the first round uh, of the NFL draft and our uh, congratulations. Denver was able to get up to 11 to take him was a trade they announced a little bit before the draft began this morning. Uh, they moved up from, ele from 14 to 11 uh, in exchange the Cleveland Browns now will pick at the 14th slot and also pick up one of Denver's third round picks, the lower of the third round picks, one that they got from Buffalo. It was originally a Buffalo pick that went to Atlanta, that then went to Denver, and now it's going to Cleveland. It's kind of like uh, our, our luggage sometimes on plane flights. That's where that uh, number 83 selection has gone to four cities in, in, a, in about a week. When we return, the LA Raiders are up. Uh, taking a break, are you? No break. <laughs>
Oh, you smell good. Well, thank you. You wearing something? Just my deodorant. Oh, that Swap Super Stick I got you. Yeah. You like the Swap, huh? Yeah. Good. It costs less than your other one. Yeah, well, I think it works really well. Mm. Don't you think so? Mm. You're supposed to be paying attention to me right now. <laughs> How many women tell their husbands they smell good while they're cleaning out the garage? Just one. That's right. Yeah. Super stick. When Swab works this well, why spend more? Nothing works better on your car's leather, vinyl, and rubber. It can turn just about any looking car. Nice car. What, this pile of junk? Give it the gun with Son of a Gun. And now give your tires a quick kick with One Step Tire Care. They're out there in record numbers, united in their respect for technology and disdain for gimmickry. Driven by thought rather than ego. Everywhere you look, there are signs of intelligent life. They are among us. They are our neighbors. They could be you. Why use Valvoline motor oil? It's the number one choice of Indy 500 chief mechanics. Daytona 500 chief mechanics. NHRA mechanics. And Baja 1000 mechanics. For use in their race cars and in their own cars. Any more questions? People who know use Valvoline. Back in the Grand Ballroom of the Marriott Marquis in New York, the 58th NFL Draft. We're chugging along towards two and a half hours and chugging toward the middle of uh, the first round here. The number 12 selection now up, uh, owned by the, the L.A. The Raiders. The silver and black of Al Davis and... Uh, we told you that maybe names they would bandy about. Patrick Bates, safety, Texas A&M. Wayne Simmons, linebacker. Chris Mortensen got an inkling on this pick? Well, Chris, I think you've given away my inkling. No, Patrick Bates certainly has to be a big consideration for the Raiders here. They've lost Ronnie Lott. Bates is by far the best athlete on the board at this point. That best athlete available thing certainly applies here. Uh, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles are sitting right behind him. I know they'd love to have Bates. I don't think that'll happen. You know, the Raiders' philosophy, though, Hey, they love corners. They love uh, offensive tackles. We know that Brad Hopkins and Ernest Dyer are still available. And you know Al could always trade here. So we've thrown it all at you. But Patrick, Do uh, Patrick Bates just makes sense here, Chris. All right, Mort, thank you. So we shall see. Bates is, is a hitter the likes of which uh, they got the last couple of years. Joe and, uh, yeah, but and Ronnie Lott. Yeah, Ronnie, I, I think you, you're thinking defensive side of the ball. But what I'm thinking is I've got to think back to Rocket Ishmael. He is the property of the Los Angeles Raiders. They have not been real satisfied in Toronto with the Canadian Football League, the job he's done. I think with Willie Galt as a free agent, Sam Grady as a free agent, this is a perfect opportunity and a year for Al Davis to exercise the opportunity to bring the Rocket back to the National Football League and give him outside speed. They still need the speed receiver. They had it in Willie, who's getting older. Now they get the Rocket back. But obviously, I'm looking at that side of the ball. Mort. Chris Mortensen knows a little bit more about that contract than I do. Mort? Well, well that's the problem, Joe, is they got to get Rocket signed. And right now, there's a hang-up because Rocket's people want uh, Bruce McNall to pay the difference between what the Raiders give him and what Bruce McNall apparently owes him. Now, they signed Rocket to a, a big contract, $18 million, a $12 million signing bonus, but those, that money was paid $3 million, $3 million, and they still owe six more million, and McNall doesn't want to pay it. In fact, if anything, he's even threatened to sue Rocket to get money back. So it, it's getting kind of ugly with those negotiations. All right, Mort, the uh, pick by the Raiders is up at the table with the Philadelphia Eagles, where you are on deck. And uh, here's the commissioner. The uh, Los Angeles Raiders select Patrick Bates, defensive back, Texas A&M. Next choice is the uh, Philadelphia Eagles with a special pick obtained as compensation for uh, Reggie White. All right, so as we said, Patrick Bates, the hitter extraordinaire, man that can play. Well, some have him 
said that they could be could play either safety, strong safety or free safety. And one scouting report that I got, guys that said that he's the type of player that you must account for his position on the field on every snap of the game. He's that sort of player, can create havoc from the safety slot, Mel. No question. I think what impressed the NFL scouts was the athletic ability for a 223-pounder. You're talking about a kid who runs 4-4-3, has a 39-inch vertical jump, can play free or strong safety. They almost use him as an extra linebacker at times at Texas A&M. Good hands for the interception, as he showed here, but a big kid at 6'3", 224 pounds, can enforce, and is typically of what the Raiders have been looking for. That dynamic, strong safety will make up for the loss of Ronnie Lott. And you can see how quickly he attacks and gets after people. That tremendous speed that usually goes unnoticed at times is there in evidence as a uh, coverage man. And there's very few safeties that can move like that. Talk about Lewis Oliver. Well, he's not the coverage guy that a Patrick Bates could be because of that speed and athletic ability. The void's there with Ronnie Lott moving on to the New York Jets. He's ideal to work with Eddie Anderson, bring along Derek Hoskins, the young kid, second year pro. They're strong at corner. Now they have the big time safety. First time a defensive back has not gone in the top 10 in the draft since uh, 1986. But Patrick Bates, uh, number 12 so let, number 12 pick overall with the Raiders, uh, certainly Mike Gottfried is at the head of his class this year. There's no doubt, Chris. He's a great athlete, and he has great size for the free safety position. But the real question on him is when you watch tapes of Texas A&M games the last two years, he just didn't make plays. Now, why didn't he make plays? Now, one, one would be the fact of the scheme of what A&M's asking him to do they ask they have him as a free safety he makes all the calls he sets all the alignments so they put a lot of pressure on him that way or is he a player that's lost in space a little bit because of his size like this it's a good choice uh, athlete wise you get a great athlete and then will he make the plays all right coach thank you the Philadelphia Eagles are uh, are up next and we'll be back in New York in a moment At HTC Tool and Stereo Centers, expect personalized service from their staff, ready to assist you in every department. Great savings every day in tools elect and a great selection of closeouts. Load up on Tool and Stereo Center. Rockwood 150 watt 2 channel amplifier 99.99. Rockwood 160 watt 2 channel amplifier 109.99. Rockwood 200 watt 2 channel amplifier 124.99. HTC Tool and Stereo Center, 2120 Sagamore Parkway South, 4746443, next to Ponderosa. <laughs> Insure people. We insure property. MBAH Insurance for the 90s. Tomorrow on ESPN, the men in black are back. Dale Earnhardt and Rusty Wallace are at it again in an early season point back of Martinsville Speedway is next, where anything can happen in close quarter Winston Cup racing. Don't miss the Haynes 500. Tomorrow night at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Back at the NFL Draft here at the Marriott Marquis in New York. The Philadelphia Eagles are uh, up on the board right now. they one of the teams that has two first-round selections. This selection, the number 13 slot, is uh, in compensation for their loss of Reggie White. They make it more next year, but right now, this is the pick that they have in this year's draft for Reggie White. They maybe need some help on the offensive line. Remember, they lost Ron Heller. Maybe they go to Ernest Dye. In any case, if you forgot what the Eagles did in 92, here's a look back. open the season on a Super Bowl pace and capped an undefeated September by clubbing the Cowboys. But Randall Cunningham couldn't sustain his torrid start and midway through the season he was benched for a game and a half. Gang Green flexed its muscle and was once again a dominant force but the Eagle D was crumbled by the Cowboys in the divisional playoffs. No matter what they won't be the same without the Minister of Defense Reggie White. 
wanted to do it. <laughs> you're beautiful. That's well, wonderful. They, they were great. It's so okay, Chris. Rushing yards was only was second. Uh, they, uh, without Reggie White, I mean, say no more what the Eagle defense will miss. And in another year, a word that maybe Clyde Simmons, maybe Seth Joyner fly the coop. But you look at teams that have gotten hit in just one year by the advent of free agency, San Francisco, Buffalo, and the Eagles. They're the ones that everybody came after. And if you count Keith Jackson's loss early during the regular season last year, Ron Heller just signed in Miami. Oh, by the way, some guy named Reggie White going to Green Bay. Jim McMahon, their backup quarterback, gone. This is to a ball club that finally busted through and won a playoff game last year. They beat the Saints, as we just should, reminded you, before they went uh, on to Dallas and got to upended in the second half against the Dallas Cowboys. So even though Reggie White gone and they're still looking to replace Joe, uh, Jerome Brown's presence inside, had Williams fallen this far, that might have been their guy. I got to think offensive line. I absolutely agree with you, Chris. I, obviously, Randall Cunningham's not going to be upset going offensive line. Herschel Walker had a very productive year. Keith Byers probably won't be a Philadelphia Eagle. His name isn't on there yet. He's probably going to be gone. A lot of face changes. This is one of those football teams in the NFC East that I think will fall back a little bit. A lot of pressure is going to go back on the shoulders of Randall Cunningham to be the offensive star. They're going to try and do everything they can to protect him. An offensive lineman right, you can't have enough of them. An offensive lineman right here may Makes an awful lot of sense. They got great speed outside, a tight end possibly because their tight end position is very vulnerable. But I think offensive line definitely is the way to go. All right. Well, let's go down to Philadelphia and see if Chris Mortensen agrees with that opinion. Mort? Well, I do agree with it. Now that Dan Williams and Patrick Bates are gone, if Philadelphia doesn't trade down here, and they've had some discussions with the Oilers who who really like Brad Hopkins of Illinois, uh, I do expect the Eagles to take Ernest Die, the 330 pound offensive tackle from South Carolina and move Anton Davis down to right guard so they would have a pretty hefty right side of the line there. Chris. There's no doubt about that. I mean it more it, it uh, and guys that we've talked about here that we're looking at 330 pound guy wasn't that long ago that a, that a tackle at 300 was the exception. I mean I remember about 10 years ago remember when the Bengals picked a, a Brian Blados in the first at 300 that's about as high as you went on the scale. Now we're talking about guys like Willie Rowe for 300 pounds being, well, he's not that big. Uh, you know, Lincoln Kennedy is big at 330. 300 is not that big. Ernest Dye at 330, Mel, he's big. Well, he was a little too big, and that was the problem. He got up to about 333, and then he dropped to 317. After the combine workout, he definitely dropped weight, and he got himself down to 317, which made him more of a mid to late first-round pick rather than a questionable second-round choice. No questionable choice for the Los Angeles Rams. A few picks ago, Jerome Bettis, the fullback Notre Dame, their first round pick. He's with Adrian Carson right now. Chris, from the security of the Grotto and the Golden Dome goes the big man to a team that's been 1-15 in, in their last 16 divisional games. Jerome, what do you think about that? Uh, I think uh, that's a need, need for improvement, but I think uh, that's one of the reasons they uh, they decided to bring me in there, hoping that I can make it make that change. you got to remember from the free agent standpoint now, they took some hits at the offensive guard and tackle positions, too. Coach Gottfried said he also sees him maybe as a Riggins-type tailback. Is that something you might want to play? Oh, definitely. It's something that I want to look at because uh, I don't want to be restricted in terms of the things that I can do. And I think Coach Knox uh, is going to give me the opportunity to do a number of different things. Jerome, it's not the Notre Dame way for a junior to come out. Now, yeah. Rick Meyer stayed around. Why are you coming out now? Well, I just thought it was the best decision that, that I could make. And uh, I, I had to think about it a little bit selfishly in a way because uh, the university couldn't help me with everything that I needed help with. And my family was a major part of that. And I think uh, it was the best decision that I could have made. Good luck out on the coast. He's weighing about 245, 46, Boomer. All right, Adrian, thank you. A pair of offensive players from Notre Dame have gone. A pair of defensive players from Alabama have gone. 7 0 5 D. The first dozen are gone here in the draft. We'll be back. Come on, let's get a cold one. Our total attendance for today's game. Oh, would you look at this beer line? I'm going to go back. What? Foul ball? No, no, I'm not. Foul ball! Foul ball? Foul ball. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down... Make it two Bud Lights, please. Make it a Bud Light. Hey, you got another ball? Phone, Mr. Lyons? Phone. Phone? Uh, hello? Why is that package you sent me? That's 
not me. What? I am shocked. Shocked and appalled. Let me confer with, with my staff. Uh, Federal Express? Only Federal Express can confirm delivery in seconds and has a tracking guarantee. Your people received the package at 9.20 a.m. I'm terribly sorry. Say no more. Let's do lunch. Nobody tracks better than Federal Express. Back uh, at the NFL draft with the Philadelphia Eagles on the phone, and you can see less than four and a half minutes to go until they make their first of two first-round selections. Their other one is the 24th uh, overall pick. This is number 13, the Reggie White pick. Kennedy and Rope, the first two tackles. Mel, where does Dye fit in on your tackle or offensive line board? He would be your third best pure bookend tackle. And then there's a drop-off. Ben Coleman from Wake Forest would fall in the line. Earl Dotson, a sleeper type at a Texas A&I, will probably be a third or fourth round pick. So only four tackles in the first two rounds. Three in the first, Coleman probably in the early second. And really, a guard as well, there's a drop-off after Hopkins and Holmes. We have Everett, the center at Michigan. So uh, the offensive line position at the top, very strong, very, very, very week thereafter. You see 330. He's been down to 317 of late. Former junior college transfer. Played two years at South Carolina. Huge. Because it does a real good job keeping that massive frame between the quarterback and the defensive end. There he was working against Mark Thomas, defensive end, who went to the 49ers in the fourth round last year. Here he does a good job opening up some running room for Brandon Bennett, their big-time junior running back. You see him here at left tackle, number 65. Completely dominates the Georgia defensive end. Uh, He's a player that, you know, moved up dramatically after the individual workouts. At that time, he was projected as a maybe an early to mid-second now, a possible mid-first. And like I said, when you want to tackle, you better get it now because after, really, Coleman died. There's a drop-off. That's why the Oilers, the Cardinals, have to be a little worried as to who's going to be there when they select. The Eagles are uh, talking a potential trade with the Oilers. Now, Mort had that a couple of moments ago that uh, the Oilers may be very interested in Hopkins, the guard. Hopkins or die? If you had to rate him purely, who would you pick, Mel? Take Hopkins. You know, he's a guard tackle. He's a solid 300-pounder. With Dye, you're getting that 317-pounder, but you have to worry about that, that weight ballooning back up once he signs that big contract. To me, Hopkins coming out of Illinois, pro-style offense. But what does Houston need in that run-and-shoot? Somebody that can protect Warren Moon. And I think Hopkins would be much more ideal than an Ernest Dye would be. Along the offensive line, in the first round, expect in no particular order, Dye, Hopkins, and the center from Michigan, Steve Everett. That may be it uh, for offensive line in the first round. And there may be, as you suggest, a major drop-off that you almost forget about offensive linemen in the second round. And then you move, uh, get back to them in the third round. Now, we have yet to have a corner go in this draft. Although you got to feel when the first goes, a run is coming. And that run is coming pretty soon. Not necessarily right here. But that run is coming pretty soon. We've only had one wide receiver go. Kind of difference a little bit. Uh, under two minutes to go, so the Eagles are going to spend all 15 minutes here, Joe. Is this a team that's in dire straits, or do they still have enough this year? Yes, they've lost Reggie White. I mean, but can they come back from that to be a bona fide playoff contender, or are they just starting to fall? I think they're starting to fall, Chris. This football team is not necessarily suffering on the field from talent loss as much as they are depression of different people upset about the way things are going. They first got upset with the, with the loss of Keith Jackson. That sort of started this domino effect. Now Reggie White is gone. Not the fact that Reggie White is gone, but it looked like the Philadelphia Eagles didn't even try to keep him. That sends a message to a lot of the different football players. Now there's talk that Clyde Simmons is almost gone for sure next year. Seth Joyner almost gone for sure next year. The people that they've lost through free agency, the moves that have been made, they're, they're just, as a football team, not a very happy group of players. When you don't get a happy group of players who have to spend a lot of time together, you just don't get a lot of production on the field. I think it's more than just loss of individual talent. It's an attitude problem that the Eagles have been in what historically has been the toughest division in the National Football League. I'm not sure whether they can handle it. I think they're taking a step backwards. They have made a couple of moves to come out all the players they've lost. They did sign Timmy Harris this week, the pass rusher from the 49ers. Eric McMillan, the one-time Pro Bowl DB from the Jets, and Mark Bavaro in maybe his final year at tight end. The Eagles and the Oilers have made a trade. The Oilers are now on the clock. That's not reflected here yet, but the announcement came a couple of moments ago that indeed that trade did happen. And now we hear another
another announcement. Let's see if we can get this cleared up. I thought they said Houston and Philadelphia had made a trade. Details which are forthcoming, and that's the trade table. <laughs> and <laughs> every table has a name here. I believe it that that's the trade, and that would make sense. Mort had that. Houston, they pick in the 19 slot, six spots below. So we assume that if there is a trade, Philly would slide down there. What they pick up is the question. What they pick up for moving down six slots uh, is the question. Um, so as we wait, the commission Houston has selected. Cleveland is still on the clock. Now, if I'm to read this, we got a little communications problem here, but Houston has to... Cleveland is on the clock, which would be the next pick. Now, what exactly is going on? I'll tell you what. Uh, the suspense is killing us. I, I'm, I, they're killing us. I don't have any fingernails left because of this deal. <laughs> I'm totally gone. Well, you can tell by the crowd at the table that, it, that, it, that it's a biggie. Here it is. A big piece of paper, too. Houston traded with Philadelphia, and with the uh, Philadelphia 13th place pick, Houston selects Brad Hopkins, tackle from Illinois. Uh, Philadelphia has received Houston's first round pick in the 19th position, and also Houston's third round pick, which is the 75th position in the draft. question is to go down the six slots and Houston obviously wanted Hopkins who can play guard or tackle did Philly get enough just getting a third round pick Mel did, did, did they get enough here I think they did they have so many need areas that one player is not going to do it and Ernest Dye is not going to get the job done they still probably will be able to get him where they're selecting but they need those third and fourth round picks yeah you know, like we said they have a ton of weak areas a ton of needs and this team is far and away the club that you're looking at is maybe dropping back one player is not going to get it done you look you see Brad Hopkins, a guy who has the strength to handle drive blocking responsibilities, also an outstanding pro style pass blocker. Coming out of Illinois, he gets those reps in practice, which are going to be invaluable once he gets to camp. What Brad Hopkins needs to do is get a little more fire, a little more intensity. And you know, any team that Buddy Ryan's coaching, be it defense or offense, that's going to come. And I think he would be, like I said, ideal for. Doesn't need that work coming in to develop pass blocking technique. He has that. Once he gets more fire, more intensity, Brad Hopkins has a chance to be a heck of a pro you know mel really brings you bring up a really i think a, a terrific point and that is is when everybody goes to the houston oilers one of the big problems that they the houston oiler offensive linemen coaches have to do is they have to teach the linemen coming in how to block in the houston oilers style it is an entirely different style of pass block teaching and a lot of technique i think it really hit hit the nail on the head here the fact that he, he hasn't had a lot of training there, he's going to have to relearn everything that he's had to do anyway, so it's a great opportunity to come, come in and go right from scratch with a specific style and type of blocking that is absolutely the Houston Oilers and theirs alone. One scout, a couple of scouts told me that of all of the offensive linemen, that Mel, we've talked about all the names, that Hopkins, probably the best athlete. So an athlete in a run-and-shoot sort of situation, that would add up. The Cleveland Browns are next, followed by the Green Bay Packers. Do we start our run on cornerbacks? We'll see. This is crazy. I gotta get out of here. But where do I go? One of these engines was filled with Castrol Syntec, a synthetic oil, the rest with conventional oils. They were then drained and started without oil to prove a point. You see, Syntec has a unique molecular structure that bonds to engine parts. Lab tests show it leaves a layer of protection far stronger than conventional oils. And if Syntec protects this well now, imagine if you leave it in. Castrol Syntec protects in ways other oils can't. at the uh, draft here in New York. 
And Brad Hopkins is now in a uh, quick trade by the Houston Oilers. Uh, become the selection with the number 13 overall selection. And uh, Mike Gottfried is back. And uh, Coach, uh, uh, Hopkins are coveted by teams right below Houston, you tell us? I think so, Chris. I think Cleveland wanted Brad Hopkins. I think they liked him. They like about four or five players. But offensive linemen, I believe they would have taken him at this next pick. Houston probably figuring that, move up, uh, take Brad Hopkins. Now Cleveland may trade down. But Brad Hopkins is a player that Cleveland really liked. They coached him in the Senior Bowl, fell in love with him. They feel like he's maybe an inch short, but could play right away. So uh, Cleveland liked him a lot. One of the reasons uh, that, the Cleveland, that maybe they lost out on Hopkins, but remember, they made that trade to go down three slots to 14. Now here's this trade, all right? Here's Hopkins uh, going to the Oilers. So the Eagles slide down six and pick up the Oilers' first round pick, and they get a third in the offing. So that uh, puts the cap on that trade. The Cleveland Browns now have a decision. All of the tight ends are left. Uh, in their offense, which is not exactly a vertical offense, uh, it's pretty horizontal, as a matter of fact, Joe. Um, a tight end is an intriguing possibility uh, for the Cleveland Browns. A corner... Once upon a time with Dixon and Minifield, you never thought you'd say corner for the Cleveland Browns, but a corner and your pick of the literate corner is another intriguing possibility for the Cleveland Browns. And they had a feeling by going down only three slots to 14 that they would have the same selection as they did at 11. So they've got a lot of wheels turning right now. <laughs> okay, what did you just say? I said tight end or corner. I know, we I We haven't heard either position. I think now it's time to start. I, I think it's definitely time to start looking. Cornerback Tommy Carter out of the University of Notre Dame is somebody that the Cleveland Browns have looked at. I think uh, Irv Smith, obviously, somebody that the Cleveland Browns have taken a hard look at at the tight end position. These are, these are guys that can help their football team right away. Bill Belichick has been very active. Obviously, the trade they made for Jerry Bowles, they got the third round pick they gave up for him when they made the deal with Denver by moving down just three places. Everybody that the Cleveland Browns expected to go at this point has gone. The people they want are still on the board. Remember, they went defense two years ago. They went fullback last year. So there's a lot of different options that they can go at. There's the defense has become very comfortable. They've got age at linebacker. No linebackers have gone. That's something else we have to look at so the Cleveland Browns have a lot of different ways to go I think it's corner but we've been wrong before the card is up we'll find out I, I actually think it's going to be an offensive center I think this Could is where you're Everett. going to see yep. Steve Everett go I they've addressed the defensive side with a choice obtained from Denver select Steve Everett there you go. center University of Michigan Joe you're on a roll the next choice is the Green Bay Packers. You know, it figures in a year when a lot of Notre Dame guys are going to go in the first round that you're nailing everything left and right, Joe. That's just happens. Uh, you know, it makes sense. You really take a look at where they have focused a lot of their attention in the free agent signings. Jerry Ball. They were they were very much in the running for Reggie White. Reggie's wife was from Cleveland. They felt like they had a real opportunity to go there. Jerry Ball, Michael Dean Perry up front. Clay Matthews gives them a, a real good linebacker for pass rushes. Bill Belichick has got to feel real good about what he's done on the, on the defensive side and protect and keep Bernie Kosar healthy. You go out and get yourself a young center. You got somebody to start to build your offensive line around. You got the big fullback last year. Uh, he's got Vinny Testaverde as a backup. All these things start to fall into place and make the Browns, in what historically has been somewhat of a weak division, a real force to take a look at in the AFC Central. Everett, I think, is a guy that Minnesota was looking at a little bit farther down since they lost Louder Milk. We've had back-to-back -back Big Ten linemen. Hopkins going to Houston, and now Everett, the center, uh, going to Michigan. I thought, really, they'd pick another Miami quarterback. I mean, they have Bernie Kosar. <laughs> they, they have Vinny Testaverde. Uh, they, they, they could pick Gino Toretta. And then Rick Barry, in case they wanted to play basketball. It's the first offensive lineman drafted by the Cleveland Browns in the first round since Pete Adams, 1973. Let's go down to Phoenix with Gary Danielson for uh, his observation. Certainly Cleveland, one of his ports of call in his NFL <laughs> tenure. Gary, your thoughts? Well, Chris, if you came to me after every one of my ports of calls, I'd be on every time there was a draft pick in this league. Well, I think Cleveland did have their heart broken a little bit when Brad Hopkins went off the board. They were hoping and praying that they could take him. They did like him a lot. But in Steve Everett, they really got a guy that's a little bit versatile. He's gotten bigger. He's up to 300 pounds right now. We've seen him all year. The last couple years in the Big Ten, he snaps the ball right-handed, left hand when he breaks the, his right hand. So he's really the type of tough football player that Bill Belichick loves to have. 
have on his football team. So I think it's a great addition for the Browns. They, they really could have helped themselves in any number of positions, cornerback, linebacker, they're getting a little bit old. So, you know, anything besides a running back probably would have helped this football team, Chris. All right, Gary, thank you. So the, uh, the Cleveland Browns have made their selection. Next on the clock, the most intriguing team we feel in the offseason this year, the Green Bay Packers. They're now on the board. Buttery soft leather seats designed to withstand 30 mile an hour rear impacts. An adjustable steering wheel wrapped in leather mounted on an energy absorbing column and exotic wood trim layered with aluminum to prevent splintering. Unlike some other cars, at Mercedes-Benz, luxury is more than a mere facade. Blue got to thinking about his career. He said, I can do more than just blue blazers. I'm getting a new agent. So he signed with Dockers. And from storm blue to sapphire, indigo to cobalt, we took blue to heights he never dreamed. Now blue's a star, but he's never forgotten who gave him his big break. Dockers. No Dockers. Sean Dockers. All right. And the phones uh, left and right. Uh, the Green Bay Packers are working their phones. We are back in New York, and uh, the pick is there. So let's uh, let's head up to the commissioner and find out the, uh, the Green selection. Bay Packers have selected Wayne Simmons, linebacker from Clemson. Indianapolis is now on the board. Now well, Wayne Simmons, linebacker. Remember uh, the Holland hurt. The Green Bay Packers uh, certainly changing their entire defense. And uh, they get Wayne Simmons. They did not Frank Carr. He's a mean linebacker. He likes to, well, yeah. he's nasty. He's got an attitude. And that's what I think what Mike's looking for. Uh, Mike Holmgren's looking for in Green Bay. He has an attitude. A little bit of a surprise here. And probably because there are so many wide receivers left on the board, Green Bay is either going to try and make a deal in the second round to move up. They definitely need to find themselves a wide receiver. Simmons helps him out on the defensive side of the ball but when you take a look at the catches sterling sharp with a new nfl record 108 catches sam j beach 17 catches ron lewis 13 robert brooks 12. that's your wide receiver receptions i've got to feel like somewhere along here the green bay packers are going to go for a wide receiver with their next pick i thought it would be here but there are so many left on the board with so much speed it makes a lot of sense to me that they went the defensive route wide receivers next Linebackers usually, Mel, is a position where you've got six or seven, some years eight or nine in the first round. This year, Marvin Jones, we knew, Simmons, that may be it. That's it. Now, I think what you have to worry about if you're the Green Bay Pennbacker is upgrading players who in a normal year may have been late first, early to mid-second round picks. There wasn't a dominant attack outside linebacker in this draft. I thought Chris Slade from Virginia, who's viewed as more of a tweener, was a number one guy. Simmons had an up-and-down career, had some big games, but was not consistent. Played it really for two different coordinators, so that could have been a factor. But when you look at Simmons, you get a guy who is solid but not spectacular. And to me, uh, I thought Dawkins, as I agree with Joe, should have been the pick. Uh, they really don't have any wide receivers opposite Sharp. Simmons proved in the senior bowl he can be an all-around linebacker. He can cover. He certainly can get after the quarterback. But I just didn't see enough star quality in Simmons while he was at Clemson to project him this high. I think he really benefited from this weak line, uh, linebacker core this season when there was really nobody that projected into the top 10 or 12, which is really rare in the first round. You normally have one or two dominant players. This year, none. Simmons probably goes up maybe 10 or 12 spots because of that. He's fast, he's instinctive, and now he's uh, a Green Bay Packer. Or he's not signed yet, but pretty soon he will be a Green Bay Packer. A very exciting things going on up at Lambeau Field. Let's go up to Foxborough and get Tom Jackson's reaction to the Packers going linebacker, Tommy. Your, uh, your thoughts on Simmons? Well, Chris, I think it's an excellent choice for the Packers. You, uh, Moss, uh, Reggie White, and all of a sudden you look at Wayne Simmons now on the outside. I watched some, some film on him. He's an outstanding outside rusher. He also is able to drop back into pass coverage. I think the, the key to this choice is that this is a kid who's going to be an every-down player. 
Tommy, let's talk the Packers now. This is a team that you and I have, have talked about a lot late in the regular season and certainly uh, in the offseason. The Green Bay Packers, a force, or pretty soon can be a force. White and Moss up front. Uh, Simmons and linebacker. You got Buckley at corner, and we know what they can do offensively. They become an intriguing team, don't they? Well, I, I think that they went out and filled almost every area that they needed to fill in the course of the offseason. Uh, as I said, Reggie White, I think, will dominate the defensive line play and make everybody else along that front uh, 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 much better ball players. A kid like Wayne Simmons comes in, he's going to get single teamed almost every game. He's going to be able to use his athletic skill to rush the passer. And again, I don't think that this was a very deep draft as far as linebackers are concerned. And this is the one kid that I thought could come in and play every down for you during the course of the season. Well, Tommy, the Green Bay Packers, we said how busy they were in the offseason. If seeing is believing, here it is. Some guy named Reggie White came over from Philadelphia. I, I don't know who that is, but uh, Harry Galbraith, guard, starting guard for Miami. They've got him, the Twinster, Twinch Ilkin, tackle from the Steelers. Bill No Moss, uh, nose tackle from the Chiefs. And they got Mike Pryor, uh, the safety, to replace the loss of Chuck Cecil. They did lose Vince Workman, but they do believe that Edgar Bennett can really step in and be a pass-receiving receiver. Uh, they have Daryl Thompson, who at times uh, came on last year. They've got a young quarterback named Brett Favre. They've got a young tight end named Jackie Harris, who's, uh, who's about to be a pro bowler. And they got a record-setting wide receiver in Sterling Sharp. The Packers on the move. We'll be back. Tea in the afternoon. Tea, everyone. Oh, why, thank you, Mandela. <laughs> Introducing Lipton Original Iced Tea. All natural, with a taste so original. You'll have to guzzle, gulp, or chug, but never sip. Lipton Original. This ain't no sipping tea. Both Visa and American Express Gold Cards can get you to La Roche-Guillon, one of the prettiest towns in France. But should something go wrong here, only Visa Gold can get you out. You had to come to France, right? Don't start, Marty. Because La Roche-Guillon's only towing service... No, we're not getting a tow truck. I can get this out. ...doesn't take American Express. We? Visa Gold, delivering what really matters. Jamal's wrong. Honey, that means I eat fat. Oh. It's everywhere you want to be. What would you do with a Motorola pager? Never miss a meeting. I don't know. Boss not home. Pager. Okay, you got the pager number, right? We're going out. Yeah. Work. What would you do? Anything. Anytime. Anywhere I want. Really? A Motorola pager lets you stay in touch with the important people in your life while doing the things important to you. The affordable, portable Motorola pager. What will it be, Phyllis? Make it a Bud Light. Sorry. This is the last one. Well, I think I've been... Well, I don't that one. What do you want to give? Four, and I'm a two, and a ten, give me ten, and a twenty, big, give me twenty, now thirty, now fifty, give me fifty, now sixty, big, give me sixty, now seventy, give me seventy, now eighty. If you want great taste that won't fill you up and never let you down, make it a Bud Light. Bud, Bud Light, Light, please. Sorry, boys. This is the last one. <laughs> The Indianapolis Colts are on the clock with the 16th overall selection. This is a team that, uh, through the draft last year, changed the whole look of their ball club. And before we talk about the Colts, let's go over to uh, Adrian Carson, who's with uh, Dan Williams with the Bronco hat, ready to roll. Well, Chris, before Dan was selected by the Denver Broncos, he was on the phone with the Falcons, and you were told that they may trade up to get you. Any indication why they took Lincoln Kennedy in their place? I don't know. It they were, you know, seemed like they're real interested, but I guess they figured that he'd be the guy that better serve them. So it was kind of a surprise. Let me ask you something. You think it has anything to do with the fact you transfer from Tennessee State to Toledo in the MAC? You're held on every play. Did that have anything to do with maybe the team doesn't really know how good you can be? Well, probably. I mean, I think, in all fairness to the MAC, there there are some good football players in there, and 
you, I think all you can do is give a guy a chance. If, if none of us ever get an opportunity, then nobody will ever know if we're good football players. It probably has something to do with me, sir. Jack Lambert, John Olford all come out of the MAC. This is the NFL. Can you live up to that reputation? Tomorrow? Yeah, I think I can, and I think I will, and, and I'm just looking forward to getting into Denver and playing right away. Chris, he's never been to Denver, never been to New York City, the first Toledo <laughs> Rocket ever selected in the first round. All right, Adrian, uh, Dan Williams rocketing uh, in the first round here. And now on the clock, the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, a tight end is a possibility here, like Irv Smith. The Trone means a big running back is a possibility. Let's go to Mort uh, down in Philadelphia. Uh, the Colts tried to move up in this draft. They were unsuccessful. What are they thinking now? Well, you know, they, 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 they eased the tension a little bit when they were awarded Will Woe for the Buffalo Bills left tackle on Friday night. So they can address their running needs here with Natron Means, as you mentioned. Now, they talked to San Diego a little bit about Marion Butts here. Uh, they've also liked Irv Smith, the Notre Dame tight end. And don't forget, Sean Dawkins is still on the board. So if they want to get Jeff George, George a wide receiver, they can go that route. Or, I, I talked to Jim Ursay, they can trade down because... They've lost uh, Mike Pryor, a defensive back to free agency, and they got five DBs who are up on contract next year, Chris. So uh, I know Jimmy was real comfortable that they had a lot of flexibility here. Well, the Indianapolis Colts all of a sudden comfortable with a winning record. They, they took that fifth place schedule and ran with it last year, finishing at nine and seven. Free agency, obviously, they addressed, uh, guys, a major, major need. I mean, this is an offensive line in the last three years, a lot, 158 sacks, but... Louder milk the center from Minnesota. The big move, Will Wolford, a, a arbitration case that they offered a, a contract that was different in dollars uh, than the Buffalo Bills would have to pay Wolford. And finally, the arbitrator ruled Friday night that Wolford did become a member of the Indianapolis Colts. Wilford, a Pro Bowl tackle, basically would have to be the highest paid offensive player for the Colts. Well, that's lower in dollars than the highest paid offensive player for the Buffalo Bills. But there was nothing written exactly in the still developing free agent, uh, not the free agent, the new collective bargaining agreement. It's still being bandied about as we speak. And not like the NBA would say it's dollar for dollar. And the Colts case was presented, and obviously the arbitrator took their case over the Buffalo Bills. So in Will Wolford now, they've changed the look of this ball club. It's a ball club, guys, that... Uh, and defensively, their front seven is a heck of a ball club. Now, let me ask you guys. We disagree on Jeff George. Let's have it out right here. Mel. George is going to prosper. He's got a line, Mel. Well, he has a line. What do you need? Now he needs some wide receivers. I think Jeff George is a very suspect quarterback, but I do think wide receiver here. They're very fortunate to have Sean Dawkins still on the board. A great wide receiver, which is what they need. Tight end, they like Irv Smith, but they have R. Buckle. They also have Kerry Cash, both of which are pretty good players. They need a defensive end, but I think it's a glaring need. If you have Jeff George, you're better getting some, some receivers that are better than Reggie Langhorn and Jesse Hester. They just don't get it done, and Dawkins really shouldn't have been here at this point. Well, but you see, they they really only got three touchdown passes from the wide receivers last year. That tends me to uh, agree with Mel in that note. As far as Jeff George goes, I disagree with him. I think Jeff George has the arm certainly to play, and the big key for Jeff has been able to find focus and disciplines in this game. He has got my first teacher as a quarterback coach, Ted Marchabroda, who I think is one of the truly exceptional quarterback coaches as well as head coaches in the National Football League. He is going to help Jeff George find the ability to get the job done. I really think that number one, Ted Marchabroda helping Jeff George makes this offense better, but also I have to think that wide receiver becomes a priority here, but you can't ignore running back. There's a couple of good ones still on the board there. Ishmael as a wide receiver is there. Hastings is there. Obviously Dawkins is there. Running backs, Reggie Brooks is a possibility. I mean, Kirby is a possibility. There's a lot of ways for them to go in those two positions in the draft. One number to keep in when we've given out their average yards of carry last year, 2.9 yards of carry that was the worst uh, in the nfl that's like an equipment man tripping over a trunk can pick up about <laughs> 2.9 yards of carry uh, johnson the culver clark and the former giant carthon are what they have but dawkins mel is your the cards going up but you had him rated ahead of Conway at wide receiver. I think Dawkins is similar coming out to what Jerry Rice was. I, I compare Conway more to an Eddie Brown because he's a great return man. You look at Jeff George, uh, you know, Joe disagreed with me when he was picked. He disagrees with me today. He'll probably disagree with me seven <laughs> years from now. He's still in the league. Disappointing. <laughs> well, we can't disagree on the pick. It, it's on the card. 
The uh, Indianapolis Colts select Sean Dawkins, wide receiver from California. The Washington Redskins are next on the board. Well, this is a player, frankly, as we said, that the Colts did not anticipate would be here. The most polished, is that, can I say that? Uh, the most polished, the more complete package right now, except for speed vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Conway, but as a wide receiver, a complete package. He's only a true junior. You're talking about a kid could have been back at California for another year. Has great size, six foot three, good speed, not great speed. But remember, they said the same thing when Jerry Rice came out, that he didn't have game-breaking ability. Sean Dawkins and me. Great hands, good route runner, comes from a pro offense where, you know, Conway came from an offense very unsophisticated. To me, Dawkins more prepared to come in right away. The reason Conway went uh, higher in the draft, he provides a little more flash. He can be a return man. Dawkins is a pure receiver. To me, to get him at the 16th pick is a steal for the Indianapolis Colts. So the Indianapolis Colts built defense last year. Now with the tackles like Wolford in free agency, and a wide receiver like Dawkins, they're building offense. I'll tell you, at times they definitely are changing in a lot of the divisions. Coming up next, hail to the Redskins. They're on the board. You can teach it. An HDC tool. And the Washington Redskins, Super Bowl champs of a season removed. Last year, uh, losers in the second round of the playoffs. The skins are on the clock. Let's quickly get uh, some opinion from Chris Mortensen of Philadelphia. Mort? Well, Boomer, you know, Daryl Green's 33 years old, and they've lost Martin Mayhew to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on free agency. So the Redskins really looking at a cornerback here, and everybody's kind of penciled in UCLA cornerback Carlton Gray. He's been a consideration, but I really expect them to take Tom Carter, Notre Dame cornerback. That will make Joe Theismann happy, and we'll continue with this fighting Irish march here. <laughs> Well, I mean, corner, they certainly have their pick of the litter, so to speak, in that position that uh, we have not had a cornerback go, and we've had 16 picks, seven of whom, by the way, are underclassmen. Joe, what about the, an Irish, a fighting Irish corner going to the skins? I think it's about time for another Irishman to go. I, I would tend to agree with Mord here. I think it's definitely an area of need with the Washington Redskins. Interesting thing about the Redskins, the only two areas that they really would not consider in this draft would be quarterback and wide receiver. They're very comfortable there. Obviously, with Martin May, you a starter gone they think Tom Carter can come in and with the style of defense that Richie Pettibone plays other than Daryl Green he's not going to put a lot of pressure on a young corner so it, it would help them tight end is definitely an area of need for them Irv Smith is still on the board it's the way the defense is going to be developed Richie Pettibone is now the head coach a lot of times we see coaches as head coaches lean their way. We saw it with Simmons, and we see we saw it with Wade Phillips as far as, as defense goes in Denver. I wouldn't be surprised if the same thing goes this way for the Redskins. The Redskins have lost a lot of starters. They're going to be changing a lot, but I don't think they're going to lose the wins and losses that people might think. The biggest starter that they may have lost is the head coach, Joe Gibbs. I mean, this is a major change. There's no question that Richie Pettibone has certainly put in his time to get this job or others that he was passed over for in years past. Does he have rough shoes? He certainly has rough shoes to fill. But because he's been there and an integral part of the team, do they lose much in the change of head coaching right away, Joe, or will this not be a bad transition? It's not going to be a bad transition, but to answer your question, do they lose much in the head coaching change? I think they lose a little bit, not necessarily in the head coaching change, but I think they lose as far as the players that they've lost. They've already said Art Monk is going down to number two. That's absolutely absurd and crazy. I don't understand that. But the other thing, but here's to take a look at what they've lost. Clark, a starter at wide receiver. Gathers, they lose to Atlanta, an in-and-out starter at the line. Mayhew's corner starter. Stokes, starter. Peters to the Jets, contributor, not necessarily the guy. But you take four of those guys out of the starting lineup, you move Art Monk down into motion, you've got five starters off your football team. 20% of your offense is not going to be, or 20% of your football team is not going to be back next year. Richie does have rough waters, but this football team is not going to look like Joe Gibbs's football team. The big question mark for me is not the job that Richie Pettibone does as head coach. He'll do fine. How well will Rod Dowauer do as the offensive coordinator? Because Joe Gibbs handled that responsibility for 12 years. Nobody 
and absolutely nobody made decisions but Joe Gibbs when it came to who was going to play and what, what plays were going to be called. That's where I think you're going to see a big personality change for the Washington Redskins. Mel, let's go to your board for a moment. And here's a team that certainly has gone over the years many a time. Uh, best athlete available. And by the way, well, we got a, a thought on the Redskins, heaven forbid, having another first-round pick. Bill, let's look at your board. Who do you got? Well, Dan Footman's still there. I figured him to be more mid to late first. Irv Smith, tight end from Notre Dame, is an outstanding football player. Great blocker, outstanding hands, underutilized in Notre Dame's offense. Troy Drayton, the speed, the potential with him is outstanding. Terry Kirby, I think the most underrated player in the draft. He will be a superlative running back in the NFL. Ryan McNeil, I think, is a better pure corner than Tom Carter, but Carter provides a little more recovery speed. McDuffie, if a little question with his knee, should be there in the late first. Holmes can play guard or tackle. Uh, Dion figures, question with speed. That's why he's still available in the later first round. We're now moving into a different group of names, and this is the first time the Redskins have had a first-round pick in three straight years since 1966 through 1968. I think they took Sammy Ball with that first-round pick <laughs> back then. Here's this pick for 1993. The uh, Washington Redskins select Tom Carter, defensive back from Notre Dame. Next selecting team is San Francisco with its pick obtained from the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, we got to give Mort the nod there on that selection. Notre Dame's third player in the first round has gone. A defensive back Tom Carter to the Skins. Mel, you didn't have him ahead of McNeil, although every team I talked to had four or five names in a different order at court. Well, we knew he was going ahead. We had that about a month ago that Carter was the best cornerback in most teams' minds. That doesn't mean he'll be the best player. These guys don't come off the board and all of a sudden equal what they're supposed to be. McNeil I like because he's a little more polished. Carter needs a little work. He's beaten by good route runners, but what he provides is that 4-4-1 speed, 44-inch vertical jump is uncalled for for a, anything other than a basketball player and you see the hands for the interception he could have been back at Notre Dame for another year decided to come out early and really capitalized on the workouts where teams look at him as a young Daryl Green coming into the NFL who better than go to to the club that, that needs him because of Daryl Green's age Green will be 33 this year losing Mayhew the pick makes sense I think somebody though with Ryan McNeil is going to get themselves a heck of a football player in the late first round the Carter is quick and he, as you say, he can learn about being a quick corner from Daryl Green because there are very few that are quicker than him. The San Francisco 49ers are next on the board. They have two first-round picks. We'll discuss the Niners in a moment. Son of a gun protected. Nothing works better on your car's leather, vinyl, and rubber. It can turn just about anything into a great-looking car. Nice car. Give it the gun with Son of a Gun. And now give your tires a quick kick with One Step Tire Care. What? This is not working. I can get a temp, but the temp won't know the software. No, I got it. I just can't open it. Changing the vertical alignment will change. Oh, nobody knows it. Nobody uses it. An insertion point. Francisco 49ers have two first round picks. Oh, by the way, this pick, number 18, came from the Kansas City Chiefs. For a quarterback you might have heard of, named Joe Montana. We talked to him this morning at 11.30 Eastern time, and at about 5 Eastern, two on the West Coast. We'll replay that interview. We'll talk with Steve Young live. We'll talk with the president of the 49ers, Carmen Policy, live as uh, we delve into one of the biggest football uh, stories that we have seen in many a year. 
the 49ers they make that touchdown you know we, we see that the, the very early the first quarter young to rice touchdown the Niners were very close to beating the Dallas Cowboys last year in the NFC title game and could have gone on to win a Super Bowl but yet if you look at the 49ers guys 12 months ago right now in April they had on their defensive line Charles Haley Pierce Holt Timmy Harris D line or to rush the passer they now have none of these guys George Seifert defensive co former defensive coordinator and, and the head coach just loves stockpiling defensive linemen as you saw Dallas do uh, on their way to the Super Bowl but yet his best or his most impact players are, are gone. Kevin Fagan was looked at this week by the Giants. He's a question. Michael Carter, will he stay? Uh, Larry Roberts has been hurt. Uh, so the question is, do the Niners have to address a need right here? I think they do. Gee whiz, absolutely, Chris. You talk about the people they've lost, but you mentioned Larry Roberts, Michael Carter, Kevin Fagan. They're all free agents. They probably won't be there. You're talking about potentially in one year losing six people who have been your starters in some capacity or another on a defensive line that, is, that really hasn't done the job I think that they wanted to. They've been close the last couple of years to winning the championship, being in the championship game, but they just haven't been able to stop people up front. This is a time for the San Francisco 49ers to really look to that area. I don't think they're going to be able to address this need in free agency. As Coach Godfrey has said earlier, teams covet defensive linemen. The San Francisco 49ers are faced with losing six in one year or six defensive people that play the defensive line. I think it's really a big area that they, it's got to be the only area that they can look at. If they can make a deal or a trade here, it'll probably be for people, not necessarily draft choices. No, there was no question that we had the three studs, uh, Copeland and Curry and Williams gone. The Niners wanted to try and get up, get one of those three guys. Now, if they're going for need, let's look at the board. How much of a fall off is there on the D-line? Not much at all. I think the group that you're going to look at now, Stubblefield and Rudolph, who can play end or tackle, in addition to Sterling Palmer, the defensive end, Todd Kelly, a defensive end from Tennessee, are as good as the players that went higher. You see Footman, you see Sterling Palmer, Mike Strahan, and Todd Kelly's an interesting player out of Tennessee. See. He's 262 pounds. He's viewed as a tweener, but you look back at 49ers. Fred Bean, Charles Haley, Tim Harris, that similar kind of player. And Todd Kelly of Tennessee was not only a great pass rusher, but he played four quarters, even though he was a little undersized. Great intensity, good attitude. They want a defensive lineman. I think they are doing just as well here as they would have if they would have had the fifth or sixth pick. I think Footman's still names that they're obviously banding about right now. Let's uh, kick it out to Santa Clara and join Fred Edelstein. Fred, what's cooking? Well, they, because they're talking with, like, a few teams. They're talking with a few. Right now, the 49ers are trying to trade down. They spent most of the early part of the day trying to trade up. Uh, you know, they didn't get the defensive lineman that they wanted. There was a possibility that they could have taken Sean Dawkins. They came in thinking defense, defense, defense. When Sean Dawkins dropped as far as he did, uh, they were in a position, he's from Cal, with Mike Sherrard leaving, with John Taylor, who knows how long he's going to last. There was a possibility there. When the Colts took Sean Dawkins, they really started to think trade down. And the reason for that is this. They've got a bunch of defensive linemen, Dana Stubblefield, Coleman Rudolph, Dan Footman, they have a lot of these guys rated relatively equally. They also have a lot of the cornerbacks rated relatively equally. They see this as an opportunity to pick up maybe one or two extra picks at the bottom of the first round or the top of the second round so they can build and take the cornerbacks and the defensive linemen here in the round. Well, Freddie, the 49ers uh, looking to trade up a lot of the day. Now it'll, it's interesting to see if we follow through on them trading down because now a quantity, they, they have the problem for them right now, I think, is that they look at a footman, and is he a player like Ted Washington, who they already have? They look at a stubble field, is he a player like Dennis Brown, who they already have? They already have some sort of guys. Do they think any one of these guys can be impact players? Who? Well, let's go back to Freddie. Any one of these guys named jump out at you more than the others of the names we just talked about? Not really, and I think that's why they're thinking right now about trading down, if they can get the right deal and pick up the extra picks. They always saw Footman separated from the other three guys. I think that there's a difference of opinion on whether it's Stubblefield or Rudolph. The coaches like one. The scouts aren't that crazy about the other. I think that they think they're solid football players, and I think they're going to be happy to draft one of these guys. The thing is, is there a real differentiation 
between one from another. I don't get about that, which is why they're on the phones right now testing the waters. Well, I don't think they will go very far down, Fred, and we understand one of the teams that they're talking with, and they did originally to go up, uh, the Phoenix Cardinals. And Phoenix, uh, they're at, we're at uh, 18 right now, and the Phoenix uh, Cardinals are 20. But it may be a moot point because we understand we have a pick. No? When we come back, we'll go to the pick. The Niners, six minutes to go. All right, we are back uh, at New York, and the trade talks that uh, you heard Freddie mentioned may have come to fruition. Uh, for your information, Phoenix is now on the board, having traded with San Francisco to obtain this pick. In return, San Francisco receives Phoenix first round pick, which is the 20th, and Phoenix's fifth round pick, which is the 116th selection in this draft. All right, so the Niners slide D. So to drop two spots, uh, they pick up a, a fifth round pick. But the same sort of player will be there at 20, Mel, uh, and the Cardinals are now on the board. Well, it's a high fifth round pick, so it's almost equal to a fourth. Uh, I think when you look at the 49ers, they're going to get one of those defensive linemen. They have five of them pretty equal, and you're only moving down a couple spots. You pick up a five. It's a good deal for the Niners. So the Phoenix Cardinals, who uh, moved up to get Garrison Hurst, but it cost them Johnny Johnson now. Uh, spend a fifth to move up a couple of slots. Let's go to Gary Daniels and see what the Cardinals are thinking about. Well, the story here from Phoenix, I think, is this trademark is Bob Ackles written all over it. Uh, they is moving. They're active in this draft. They thought that Philadelphia might take Die ahead of their pick. They moved. They reacted. They want to get Die. They need an offensive lineman for this football team. They jump ahead. Die is going to be their pick. They went into this draft looking for maybe an outside rusher. First, they got Garrison Hurst. Now it looks like they're going to take Die. Back to you. All right, Gary. Thank you. I think you have that uh, pegged exactly.